Thanks for joining us, everyone. This is the Wednesday, March 6, 2019 meeting of the Amherst Planning Board. First item on our agenda is minutes, and we do have the minutes of Wednesday, December 12th in our packets today. So if folks have had a chance to review those, when they've had a chance to review those, I'll entertain a motion on those minutes. I move we approve the minutes. I'll second. That's moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? All opposed? All abstaining? So that passes 502. I believe those are the only minutes in our packet today. All right, thank you. Pam is on the job, and she's going to catch up on the minutes. Great, thank you. Next item on our agenda is public comment period. Is there any public comment? This again would be the period to comment on any items which aren't otherwise going to be discussed later on the agenda. I see no public comment. The next item is a 710 public hearing for site plan review. It's not quite 710 yet, so we'll work our way through a few more agenda items. Item four, planning and zoning. Zoning subcommittee reports. Zoning subcommittee has not met since the planning board last met. Is there any public comment about planning and zoning? And are there any other issues on planning and zoning? Seeing none, move on to uh, the next item is perhaps gonna be a, a somewhat lengthy discussion. So we're gonna skip over item 5A first. Are there any old business items not reasonably anticipated? Are there any new business topics not reasonably anticipated? Not that I know of. Okay. Do we have any Form A subdivision applications? Yes, we do. And I'd be happy to explain it to you. Please. I'm going to pass around a locus map um, showing where this property is located. It's located on Main Street. It's the two um, small square properties in front of the uh, Hills House on Main Street. And um, the uh, Amherst Media is proposing to build a new building there. And they're going, they're asking to combine the two parcels that are shown in this little map here. So while that's being passed around, I will come by with the large plan which shows um, exactly how these two parcels are going to be combined. And you will note that um, the parcel extends out into the town uh, sidewalk. Um, there was a, an error that happened when um, improvements to Main Street were made and um, the improvements were actually made on private property. So there's going to be an arrangement to have an easement um, the town will take an easement from the property owner to accommodate that, um, that error. But you'll see it as I come by. So if you all would authorize Mr. Stutzman to sign these plans, um, that would be appreciated. Any comments, questions on that ANR? Okay, seems pretty straightforward to me. Thank you. Are there any upcoming ZBA applications? I think I've told you about the ZBA applications coming up, but I'll just go over them. Um, there is an application for Hickory Ridge, which is going before the Zoning Board of Appeals to um, install a solar array 
on that property. They've made some changes to the plan since you saw it. Uh, there's only one entry drive now. Um, and I can't remember if they're, oh, they're, uh, yeah, they're, they're not able to use both bridges, so they're just going to use one bridge. The, the changes aren't really very significant. Um, we also have, um, let's see, Mass Alternative Care is going to be coming in with a proposal to um, establish a, a recreational marijuana and a medical marijuana facility at 80, no, 55 University Drive. I think you already know about that. That's the building that used to be the hangar. And then um, Herbology Group is also going to be coming forth, and they have actually come forth with a proposal to establish recreational and um, medical marijuana in the Rafters building. So that, that has actually been submitted to the CBA and, and will be on the docket. Um, there's also a proposal to take the White House at the corner of North Pleasant Street where it meets Pine Street. It used to be the old Daisy's restaurant. Um, that White House has been operating as um, a mixed-use building for a few years, and it used to be Kendrick Property Management that was the commercial portion of that mixed-use building. Um, the applicant is asking to, that the whole building become residential use, um, which is um, a, going to be a converted, they're calling it a converted dwelling. That's the section of the bylaw that it falls into. And um, I think if there's anything else. I can't think of anything else. And, and in terms of the planning board, we know that Amir McChee is coming forth with his site plan review application for his building on Southeast Street. Michael. Uh, Chris, is the date for the uh, Hickory Ridge uh, appearance at the ZBA set? I believe it is the 14th of March, which should be next Thursday. It was not listed in the uh, in the advertisement that was published last week as one of the um, items that was being considered, so I, that's why I ask. All right, I will find out about that and I will email you. Thank you. Was that all for upcoming ZBA applications? That's it for ZBA applications. Thank you. And are there any upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications? Not that I'm aware of other than Mr. McChee and his um, proposal for Southeast Street. All right, thank you. So it's about time that we can start our next item. This is item three. This is a site plan review. I'm just going to up the preamble here and in accordance with the provisions of section 5 and 11 of chapter 48 these public hearings have been duly advertised and notice there have been, has been posted and mailed to abutters they're being held for the purpose of providing an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding the proposal and this is SPR 2019-03 the Emily Dickinson Museum at 20 Triangle Street and 280 Main Street requesting site plan review approval to convert a single family house to administrative offices for the Emily Dickinson Museum, a nonprofit museum and educational institution under sections 3.330.0 and 3.334 of the zoning bylaw, including site improvements to 20 Triangle Street and 280 Main Street for access and parking. This is map 14B, parcels 20 and 27. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Do you have small copies of everything I'm presenting? Okay. 
And if I could just ask you to pause for one moment, are there any board member disclosures on this item? All right, please proceed. Okay, so this is an uh, overall site plan. This is the Dickinson Museum. This is <coughs> Triangle Street. This is Triangle Street right here. It's important to note the sidewalk on Triangle Street is on this side of the road, and currently the two parcels are not connected in any way. There's shrubbery uh, that divides them. The intent of the project is to relocate staff offices from the museum to 20 Triangle Street. That's the primary purpose of the project. The secondary purpose is to establish a seminar room so that they can have 30 people come in and take seminars. That's what's making it a public building, essentially. And the cost of the project is over 30% of the assessed value, so the Architectural Access Board triggers full compliance, which would be an elevator, all entrances accessible, the whole gamut. So the four variance requests that we made to the Architectural Access Board is um, to not require vertical access in the building, to require one of the two entrances to be accessible to the public, to, in the event um, the bidding costs come in greater than, than the budget, that one of two toilet rooms that are required by the plumbing code be allowed to be located upstairs without an elevator. And the last one is to allow the accessible public parking spaces to be located at the museum and access via this accessible walkway to 20 Triangle Street. They may say no. The limit on that is 200 feet, and it's 270 feet on that route. I met last week or the week before with the Amherst Disability Access Committee, and in the event that would be granted, they would like to have two accessible spaces in that location. Currently, there's one staff space and one van accessible space. For the purposes of permitting, I'd like to permit what we've shown is the van accessible space in this location. One of the reasons that this is a consideration is when seminars come, they're going to check in at the museum, and then those, those folks are going to walk over to 20 Triangle Street. So we'd like everybody to come to the same location. Additionally, this is a very tight driveway, and I prefer to be able to market staff only so that anyone coming to the museum is parking on Main Street and going to the museum. Uh, so this is an accessible walkway. It has a small gate, which is located midway, so that when it's not being opened to the public, the gate can be closed. We've got some granite ballers providing lighting. And on the north side of the building, from this accessible uh, parking space, coming around the building and into the building. This is the primary um, public access on the south side. That porch is going to have to be rebuilt, which I'll show you bring the porch level up to the finished floor level. And for parking, overall parking. There are old ones. No, I got to hold them up. Oh, there we go. Um, Parking required is six by square footage. We are proposing that there are three total parking spaces, including the accessible space. If the access board granted the variance to utilize the parking at the museum, we would reduce the width of this 16 feet of paving to maybe 10 or so. Um, and then again, this would be marked um, staff only. At our site visit today, there were some considerations which I can show you as well in terms of additional options for increasing the parking. But essentially, um, we're not able to reach the required six and stay within the lot coverage. 40% is the maximum lot coverage. I believe this is 34%, which includes the, the pathways. For reference, on the interior of the building, uh, there's an existing staircase here that's being proposed to be removed. This is that south porch. So you would come from the museum in this location. Here's your entrance. One accessible toilet room, a second toilet room. In the event we need to reduce the cost of the project, we'd leave that stair, put the second toilet room upstairs where there's an existing bathroom now. 
It includes accessible kitchenette, so this whole ground floor would be accessible, and then the second floor is offices. So not much scope. <laughs> uh, on the exterior, on the front of the building, the only changes are twofold. Rebuilding the front steps so it has compliant handrails, providing a fire alarm beacon. Uh, the building will be connected by fire alarm to Amherst College Dispatch. Amherst College is the owner of the museum and this building. It's operated by the museum in a partnership. On the back side, we take a bay out to make those um, bathrooms. On the north elevation, there's no change except for a floodlight to light that accessible walkway, which if it's eliminated, we would eliminate the lighting. And um, there is one large tree that would be is being proposed for removal, which is approximately here. It's a large oak. It's very close to the building. Drops lots of uh, debris on the roof, and will eventually compromise the foundation. And then there's some a tree here, a spruce that's going to be trimmed if this walkway goes in. So that's our proposal. I don't know if we want to talk about options on parking and discussion or? We're going to have a general discussion shortly. The first item that we're going to move into is a report on our site visit that happened today. There are some questions that came up there, some of which I think you've already addressed, but perhaps not all. So we do have a written copy of the site report, site visit report in our packet. And I'll just go through some of the questions. Again, some of these have been addressed. These were questions raised by the board uh, members who are present today. And so one question is, is the proposed stone dust pathway surface considered to be accessible? Yes, if it's maintained, and it will be maintained by the college. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is about the length of the pathway, which I believe you explained is uh, too long by typical code standards, but you could be granted that length potentially. Correct. Thank you. Uh, question, should the driveway remain at about 10 feet wide to retain the existing stone wall along the east side of the house? And as I'm going through these, if the written version of the question is needs any clarification by the member that asked it feel free to chime in was that last one uh, relatively clear uh, the question is clear the answer is not right um, <laughs> so what we're originally proposing is there's a loose laid Goshen wall that's there and for considerations of plowing and not catching that wall with the plow we're proposing to remove it and regrade widen the existing uh, gravel drive t from 10 feet to 14 feet and then have two parking spaces here. Um, we, you know, the, the, the primary consideration for removing that wall is to widen a very narrow area and then the plowing consideration. Um, two options that we prepared after the site visit today. So one option, which is option A, would be to leave the majority of that motion wall where it is. And quite frankly, if we're granted the variance not to provide the accessible space, all of that wall around this corner could remain. But we needed to remove some of it to make that additional width. And to rebuild a portion of wall here, there's a pretty substantial grade difference between the base of the foundation and here. That would allow three parking spots here and a fourth here. So you could pull back and maybe make a two, two series turn to get out of there. Another option is to leave the Goshen wall entirely as it is. And this is showing three nine by 20 spaces for parallel parking, which I think would be fine if it's staff only. I'm not too excited about it if it's public coming there and jostling around. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, and these are both still working 34% on the lot coverage. So, they work. Great. All right. So, we have a couple options we have there. A couple so, options. I don't want to be the plow driver. <laughs> Fair enough. 
All right. Following up with uh, subsequent questions, should the shrubs along Triangle Street be trimmed and partially removed to improve sight distance for those entering and exiting the driveway? Right here, I patched it in blue. This is the existing shrubbery. Um, yeah, that could easily be cut back a little bit to improve visibility looking down Triangle Street, which is a toboggan run in the mm -hmm. winter anyway, as you know. Great, thanks for providing that option. Uh, should there be a third parking space? And I'm not sure about this question. It appears there's three parking spaces proposed in each version of the plans. So, yeah. Christine? Yeah, that was so it. the original plan has three, and mm -hmm. then these new ones have four, okay. because of the, the requirement is six. Great, all right, thank you. And then, again, I'm not, exactly clear who is posing this question. If the Architectural Access Board agrees there is no need for an accessible parking space on the north side of the house, would the Planning Board also agree? And of course, that's our, our job here today is to decide whether we're going to uh, grant the site plans as proposed. Was there any additional component to that question? Okay. Okay. All right, so that sums up the issues, questions that were raised at the site visit, we also have a development application report that was prepared by staff. There were a few issues that staff mentioned the board may wish to consider, that the board may wish to include a condition that all new lighting be downcast, that the board may wish to inquire about proposed methods of controlling siltation and runoff, relative to the request for a waiver from the erosion control plan. That is one waiver among five, including that plan, the sign plan, traffic impact statement, construction and logistics plan, construction and logistics plan, and the pollution and hazardous materials plan. Uh, the board may also wish to inquire about signs needed to identify the building and its address, signs for the parking lot, signs for deliveries, etc. Board may wish to grant the waiver for the traffic impact statement because the number of vehicle trips will be a small fraction of the overall vehicle trips that operate on adjacent streets. And the board may wish to continue the public hearing until the local historic district commission has provided comments on this project. Board may wish to grant the waiver for a construction logistics plan because of the limited amount of work. And finally, related to the parking waiver, which was discussed already, uh, the board may wish to waive the requirement for six parking spaces and grant the uh, approval for the plan as proposed. So um, next step here will be questions from the board. Are there any? Mari? I just have a curiosity question. So for the museum, you don't need to provide um, accessible, like let's say if someone has a handicap and needs to access the offices, that you, you don't have any obligation to provide? No, not for employees, just for the public. But if there was an employee who worked at the museum, there's going to be two spaces there as well. Okay, so they could alternatively so. use them. Okay, thanks. Maria? Mm -hmm. and, and if I could add, and one of the reasons that we're permitting that is they may in the future want to do that. So we want to, you know, secure that possibility. Anything could happen, as you know. Um, this might not be a question you can answer. I don't know. But the two options you gave, would they also work for deliveries? Um, right now it's the same amount of paving, but I guess there'll be cars in different locations. I'm just wondering if both are feasible. It's extremely tight. I think yeah. if someone were gonna make a delivery, they're gonna pull in here, they're gonna stop, okay. they're gonna make the delivery, they're gonna work their way mm -hmm. out. Okay, okay. Yeah, just wanna make sure both were, yeah, thought yeah. through. Christine? Thank you for doing this option A and B. Uh, do you have a preference to either? Yes, the original proposal, <laughs> because of the plowing issue. As you, you know, it's loose laid and plow gets that thing, it's, it's gonna rip it apart, so. 
and Amherst College is providing the maintenance and they have a lot of plowing to do. I'm sorry, I missed what your, op your, your preferred option was. Our original proposal with three spaces. Christine? So this is the reduction of the 14 feet to the 10 feet, on the, like keeping the 10 and, and instead of expanding to 14 is how I should say it. Um, so we've got very, over, you know, fairly overgrown bushes in the front. I'm not sure, could you expand a foot or two um, to the east? Yeah, I mean, we can, we can trim that a bit to get a little more room, yeah. It's gonna look a little gnarly with those, but. For a year, yeah. Christine, did you mean that relative to one of the specific layouts or just regardless of which layout is chosen? Oh, um, I, I have a preference for adding the extra space to get it closer to what the, the regs say, um, but I understand that you know, 10 feet, it's a standard driveway, but it makes it a little bit more narrow for the plows. It is maintained by Amherst College, so they're professional snow plowers. But mm -hmm. so I understand you don't want to catch the wall and damage it, but maybe we could get, you know, a foot or two would make the big difference. It would be 11 or 12 feet then, and I just being out there today, mm -hmm. I don't want to hack those bushes to make them look unsightly, but. Um, could you get an extra foot? I mean, yeah. Jack. Uh, I know um, the U's, uh, they, they do sort of have a, a shelf life, and I, don't, I haven't observed it. Are they overgrown? How many years do you anticipate them being there before they need to, you know, maybe be replanted or replaced? They're large. I don't know how much more time they would have. Uh, before they have to be replaced, but they're you know they they can easily take a little trimming. Um, they're probably eight feet tall, nine feet tall right now. Christine. So it appeared to me today that they had been topped off to control their growth, and they probably have been there a while. And it's something to consider that they are going to continue to grow. So if you just have ten feet, or even if you expand to fourteen, right? It, that's the problem with these. And as you cut them back there is an ugliness to them. So mm -hmm. there is a lifespan that, you know, but Amherst College, if they're the ones who are going to do the landscaping, they might have an estimate for that. Mm -hmm. Michael. Uh, this is on a slightly different <clears throat> uh, topic. Uh, I'm concerned about the purpose of and need for a gate. Um, there is no fencing between the two properties that's being proposed, is there? Uh, the, the basic reason for the gate would be, you know, this is, they're, they're, they feel when you're in the space as two separate properties right now. The grounds of the Dickinson are, are disconnected. And so we're going to open up some of the, the corner um, uh, shrubbery and small trees there. And the intent of the gate is when there's not a seminar being conducted and it's staff only, the gate can be closed just to signal, you know, don't, don't go to the neighbor's house. For all intents and purposes, I think the intent is that it doesn't change the residential character of the building from either Triangle Street or from, um, from the Dickinson grounds themselves. So. But the way the public uses that, the grounds to the uh, east of the homestead uh, is as essentially as a public park. Mm -hmm. um, and barring... Uh, barriers of one sort or another, heavy shrubbery or something like that, it'll be very simple to walk from the Dickinson Homestead property to uh, the property under consideration now, as we did today when we walked through the snow. Uh, uh, I, I, if, if budget is an issue, it strikes me that um, a gate, although it can't cost very much money relative to the whole project, uh, it seems kind of silly. Uh, standing out there in the middle of nowhere with no fence on either end of it, just a gate, freestanding. Uh, it's very simple to go around, but if anybody wants to go around it, uh, perhaps it blocks the path, 
But it's, as, as you suggest, it's, a, it's not a cement path, it's a, it's a stone dirt path. Um, uh, I, um, it seems peculiar to me, that's uh, basically all I can say. Other comments, questions from the board? Chris. I would be concerned about um, decreasing this, the width of the driveway to 10 feet. Um, the zoning bylaw does say that um, for an individual driveway, um, driveways shall not be less than 12 feet. Um, 10 feet is pretty narrow. It's the size of a standard, you know, mall parking lot space, parking space. Um, so, you know, there are going to be cars kind of trying to get in and out of here. Not that two cars could pass in 12 feet, but it just gives people a little more wiggle room. And 10 feet does seem very narrow. It may work for a single family home, but I think in this case, it's, um, it's sort of taking a chance. Christine? I agree with you, Chris. Um, so this is where the, the client or the owner sort of has to weigh the difference. I think the wall is beautiful um, and would hate to see it go, which was sort of proposed. Um, and bushes are, or tree, you know, all have a lifespan. So there's sort of a trade-off that sort of has to be decided here. Are you going to go into the wall or are you going to rethink the old arborvitae or hemlocks or whatever? Other comments, questions from the board? Are there comments and questions from the public? Okay. This would be the time for any further comments from the applicant, and then we'll move on to final questions and comments from the board. So again, in the development application report, we have a number of suggestions from planning staff, including granting the waivers as requested. I'm referring to the, the submission waivers. Uh, the parking waiver is a little bit more complex. I would agree with including the condition regarding lighting being downcast. Any comments on that? No? Is anyone interested in continuing the public hearing until the local historic district commission has provided comments? That is planned to happen at their March 11th meeting. Um, I, I, the, the issue of, of uh, priority, you know, who, who speaks first, uh, is, is, is at risk here, uh, is, is at issue here. Um, I suspect that, well, no, I, I shouldn't say that, but I, it seems to me that uh, the two bodies ought to be working in, in, in concert with one another. Does the Historical Commission have the... Uh, authority to uh, deny, delay, re dem demand changes. Uh, I'm not quite sure what their uh, responsibilities and authorities are relative to this project. And if, if they're recommending, uh, perhaps we should wait till they recommend. Uh, on the other hand, if we're recommending to them, perhaps we should go ahead. Uh, Chris, what is the proper order here? It's a little bit, um, what should I say? There's a little tension there because both bodies have permitting um, authorization. So you will be approving a site plan and they will be approving exterior changes. And um, they have the authority to deny the change. Mm -hmm. Unlike the design review board which recommends right. things, they actually have denial ability. So um, you, you could say that you approve the site plan and then add a condition. I, I did give you a list of possible conditions, and one of the conditions is if the local historic district um, requires uh, a substantial change from the plan that you're seeing tonight, that the applicant would come back to you at a public meeting, and then you would determine whether um, there's a 
a need to reopen the public hearing or whether you could um, accommodate whatever change it is at the public meeting. That makes perfect sense to me. And uh, to Chris's point about the possible conditions that were proposed, they included the one just discussed, the one I proposed and mentioned relative to the exterior lighting, also that the applicant shall submit a plan showing a bike rack location for the approval of the board at a public meeting. <laughs> That landscaping shall be installed in accordance with the landscape plan and once installed shall be continually maintained. Disturbed areas shall be loamed and seeded unless otherwise specified. And that the if the architectural access board determines that no accessory parking space, accessible parking space is required at 20 Triangle Street, the applicant shall return to the planning board for review and approval of the deletion of the accessible parking space. So we have these five conditions that have been proposed by staff that could accompany any potential approval of the site plan. Yes. Uh, this is the first time I've mentioned the condition of a bike rack. Is this a requirement? It normally is a requirement, and normally the planning board does strongly encourage people to um, include bike racks. Um, it may be that um, it only is required for parking lots over five spaces, and I'll check that right now. Is there a bike rack situated on the grounds of the larger? No. Thank you. Did staff mean this uh, proposal to show a bike rack specifically on the parcel in question? It would occur to me that I would be open to siting of a bike rack that does not now exist anywhere on the grounds in an alternative location. Chris? So the actual requirement is that um, for all uses that applicants are required to provide a bike rack if you have uh, 10 or more parking spaces. Um, but generally speaking, the board does encourage the installation of a bike rack even for less than 10 parking spaces. So having a bike rack at the Emily Dickinson Museum may be a good compromise in this case. Uh, not only a compromise, it's, I, would, I would think it would be vastly preferable because the number of customers, persons using the main entrance at the museum would always vastly outnumber the number of people using the, quote, seminar room, unquote, uh, in, the, uh, in the new building. So I think a bike rack, if we need a bike rack, I think it should be on the grounds of the homestead. There's certainly more room for it there. Uh, and uh, it would be, uh, it would serve uh, the, uh, the public as well as the uh, occasional uh, student docent that uh, works in the, in the museum as well. So I agree in principle with the requirement for a bike rack. I think that it would also be reasonable to have that be at some point later in the process. I wouldn't want to unduly hold up the applicant in their work. So if other members of the board are open to something along those lines, we could have it either be required before a certificate of occupancy is issued for the building or a date later than that prior to CO. I see general nods of agreement. So we'll structure that accordingly. Yes. Um, I think it would be appropriate for me to discuss that with the client to see if they want a bike rack near the historic home. Um, we have plenty of time for the permitting process. Um, I don't need to pull a building permit for five or six weeks, so we have plenty of time there. Additionally, I was reviewing the bylaw on the local historic district commission. The word stone wall does not appear in the bylaw or the rules or regulations. They don't have jurisdiction over planting. They don't have jurisdiction over sidewalks. So I don't know if that will be part of the discussion to retain the wall or not when we meet with them, but that would have an impact. Are we going left or are we going right? Chris? I believe I don't have the local historic district um, bylaw in front of me. I believe that they um, can comment on structures, and I would consider a stone wall to be a structure. So they don't have um, the ability to comment on plantings or driveways or walkways or things like that. But I think if they're a vertical structure, I believe that they do have jurisdiction over that. So anything on the building and anything um, that's a stone wall. That's my understanding. Christine? Uh, Chris, what about just back to the bike rack? Now I'm thinking if you if it didn't fit on this property and instead they put it on the museum property, does the historic commission weigh in on types of bike racks or how large or, I don't know, that. 
Chris? The local historic commission might want to see it if it's going to be visible from the street. Other board member thoughts on the bike rack issue, Jack? Uh, I would just Robert. mention that the Valley, uh, excuse me, Valley uh, bike share program that is in existence now is in further encouraging, I think, us to provide uh, or ask for the bike rack. Christine? So will the bike rack be also brought up at the historical commission meeting? Only if um, Mr. Hartman um, is going to propose it. If you require it, then he would have to talk to them about it. So if I could ask the applicant, would you prefer, it sounds like you'd like to speak to your client about their preference on the bike rack. So we could draft a condition that requires you to install a bike rack. We could continue this until a future hearing. Do you have a preference for how we proceed with that? I'd rather continue it. I think that'd be better. Because if you make a condition, I have to mm -hmm. work it out of it. And given the historic district may have purview over the, the wall, if they want to keep it, then I'm going one way or another. So like I said, it's a small project that's complicated. <laughs> mm -hmm. Michael? Uh, given the nature of the institution and the number of parking spaces we're talking about uh, and the uh, uh, inappropriateness of a bike rack in a historic district, the visual inappropriateness or perhaps anachronistic appearance, uh, I'm wondering if we need to require a bike rack at all. Uh, it, it seems to me that uh, we're not bound to uh, require one, and uh, I, for one, uh, would prefer not to put that uh, requirement on the uh, on the museum property e in any place. If it has to be there, I think it works better at the at the uh, homestead. But uh, if it's if we don't have to do it, I would prefer not to require a bike rack in this case. I was actually thinking along the same lines, and I wonder if we might just provide a condition that the applicant comes back to us to discuss the possibility for placing a bike rack somewhere on the property, which would allow the conversation to continue, but not mm -hmm. unduly hold them up. Does that sound reasonable? Mm -hmm. Christine, that. okay. And are there any preferences on the time frame for that? I proposed prior to certificate of occupancy previously. So we'll go with that, okay, thanks. Are there any comments or questions on the other conditions that uh, staff have proposed? So at this time, we could either go through all the site plan review criteria, or I would also entertain a motion to find that the proposal is in keeping with all of those criteria and to grant the request for site plan review approval with conditions as discussed, also to close the public hearing. I have a question. Yes. The DA, the Disability Access Advisory Committee made recommendations. And what's the status of those recommendations for this for our approval here? So it's the, they recommended that the Kitchenette be ADA accessible. It is. It is. I'm sorry, I missed that. And further to so that, that so if that, so all of the recommendations so have will all of the recommendations of that committee have been met by <clears throat> the, the, the plans is submitted? I think the report also says that in addition to the two um, spaces which would be here drop-off also be located over there um, that could be a 15-minute drop-off but it needs to be marked eight feet away from any building wall so it's a little problematic um, that recommendation 
My sense is if you have the two parking spaces here, um, if that variance is granted, then that should accommodate the accessible need parking. And then if it's just a delivery, they're going to park in the middle and they're going to drive away. So the drop-off seemed redundant to two van accessible parking spaces. Thank you. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Sorry. I think we need to make a clarification. So I don't think that they're meeting all of the requests, and that's why they're asking for the variance for the... I, I just wanted to clarify that. Chris? Excuse me. I can't quite hear you. Yeah, I'm, I was just trying to clarify that they don't make all the conditions, so the variance is requested this one, number four. So that's why yeah. they're asking for a variance, because they're not meeting that condition, correct? Number four of the report or the site visit? No, of the DAAC, the DAAC oh, requirement. Okay. Let me see number four. Yes, they were supportive of this. No, I know, but the question was different. The question was whether you're meeting all the all conditions. The uh, if the variance is granted, yes, we would meet all the recommendations. So we don't know that yet. We won't know yeah. that for yeah. a I month. Just yeah. So that's a provisional requirement. If the access board says no, <laughs> you need to provide it, we're going to provide it. Yeah. Christine? So how I read this is there's variances that you're asking for, and then at the very bottom of the second page are the recommendations from the actual disability. That's like, correct. So is that what you're asking at the bottom of the page? Were those three recommendations? No. I, I was, but, but Ari clarified that these are also provisional variance requests that will be addressed by they haven't been granted they haven't been granted yet they are asking for that the variances mm -hmm. yeah we yeah, yeah. understand that but it's not yet approved david did that address your question yes, yes. great all right other comments, questions? Again, we can proceed through the criteria for site plan if members prefer, or I'd entertain a motion to find that the proposal in keeping with those criteria. Is there a preference, Jack? Uh, just another question. If the, if the use are modified or removed, does that require uh, any action by, by the planning board or tree warden? At a later date, or Chris? I think um, maybe you need to clarify which plan you're approving then, if you're talking about removing use. My understanding was that you were thinking, um, in entertaining the idea of approving the plan as it was proposed, as Mr. Hartman has proposed it, and not um, going with one of the options. So if you didn't go with the options, then um, only some use might need to be removed in order to provide site distance. So I guess that might be part of your motion. If you're going to go along with Mr. Hartman's plan, then part of the motion might be to remove those use at the end to provide greater site distance. Does, does that clarify things? Yes. And so that the comment you made brings up the two points of which of the three options we've presented are we approving? I had suggested approving the original plan as proposed. And the second question being, do we want to request the removal of the use as shown in one of the plans? Christine? Um, so I brought up the line of sight at the driveway point. Um, and I, I was really only interested in the small arbor vitae that's the little round one to be removed. And because I did know it could be aesthetically not pleasing to hack into the hemlocks. So to clarify, you were the one that recommended that some of the heads be removed, but you only meant that one 
planting, which was just indicated on the plan? Uh, my desire was that the arborvitae be removed and that area be landscaped appropriately so that there wasn't new growth put there. Four foot area? Yeah. Five foot three, area? Yeah. 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 All right, and then the question of preference among the, th the three proposals. So I had suggested that we approve the plan as originally proposed. Uh, comments, questions on that? Christine? Um, only curious on what the rest of the board thinks. You know, they're required to have six parking spots and they're trying to reduce it to three, but four, they've given us options with four water people's and part of that was also with whether or not keeping the wall I think that the parking needs of the site are well served as shown in the original proposal especially considering that it's part of a broader site which has additional parking capacity yes. uh, currently staff there's currently there's one staff parking space at the museum mm -hmm. and one van accessible parking space at the museum so the staff parking space would be relocated to 20 Triangle. All of the staff either parks on Main Street or on uh, Webster or at the alumni lot at Amherst College. Christine? And Do you know just what a reminder that what they're um, trying to achieve here is to have seminars with, they said, up to 30 people, which is, that's a fairly significant sized crowd. It, they all came in their own cars. And there is some public street parking, but that's why I was like, maybe they should try to maximize their parking. Michael? Uh, I was wondering if, if you know uh, how many staff members uh, are work, would, would be working in this uh, new building, uh, and uh, are they, are they full-time staff or part-time staff? Do you know? It's a combination of full and part-time, and in the spaces itself, there is one office reception area on the first floor and then five offices on the second floor and this may be shared with two people so seven staff members jack uh, where is the alumni uh, parking lot you mentioned it is off of Spring Street, behind the Lord Jeff. You can go diagonally through Webster to get to Main Street. I park on Spring Street to get to Hastings. That's where I'm parked now. So. <laughs> Christine? So if there were seven people working there and they have a seminar with 30 guests, that's 37 people. You know, there is some street parking, but that's going to put quite a load on it. Um, so I, I was just thinking, you know, any space that you can properly design in there would be worth it. So, Christine, did you have a preference amongst the three potential parking layouts that we have here? For ease of the drivers, um, I like option A. Yeah. I think that would be the easiest to maneuver in and out. Um, again, my only, you know, and again, it comes back to the wall or the use. Um, I think 10 is a little tight, 12 would be better, but again, that has to be talked with the client and, um, and why don't we Why don't we defer to another meeting? We'll meet with the historic district and see if we can modify the wall, take the wall out, what the, what the opinion is. Because this, I mean, this is, this is modifying the wall for 70% of it. It's not just taking it away, it's taking it out, regrading and rebuilding it. It's double the work True. from just taking it away. You're going to have to take the wall out and then rebuild it in a new location mm -hmm. at here and here. The only part that's remaining would be there if they want the wall to stay and we cut into the use. Christine? Correct. So the top part is already is going regardless. 
maybe your original yeah in the original proposal right. all of the wall would be going with wow this is cut with the option which you're hoping that you will not be required to have a handicapped spot at the site and if I or uh, isn't that when you would reduce the top in the original proposal all of the wall is being removed mm -hmm. and um, then that would allow us to widen the drive there adjust the grades here adjust the grades here to get the parking to work in this particular scheme this portion of the wall which is being relocated just a couple of feet as it's shown here this is just a couple of feet and then this would have to be rebuilt for grade um, i brought this because i had a sense this would come up that red line is the edge of the existing wall so that's what has to be rebuilt to get the eight foot and the eight foot aisle In your original option. Yeah. Can you see that? Sorry. Yeah. Can, Can we, we pass, pass that pass around? That down. Down. Thank you so much. Christine? So, you know, my interest really is not so much about the wall. I think the wall is very nice. Um, I guess my two issues right now is I would like to see parking maximized. Um, and yet in a way that is efficient for plowing and for the usability of the spaces. Mm -hmm. How it's done, whether the wall or the, that's not my, that's for others to figure out what they want. Mm -hmm. So you're not suggesting that the applicant run with a particular one of the three options we see in front of us for their purposes of their next hearing with the local historic district my my personal opinion would be option a as i said before because it provides four spots the there's also four with b but i think usability wise a is a smarter option either way we're still dealing with the the 10 foot um, driveway um, the original option it, you know it has three spots so i'm either way the wall gets affected you know so the details I, I'm trying not to get in the weeds I would just like to see four rather than three spots mm -hmm. I mean for whatever that matters I would be in favor of the original because I really think that the gaining of the one spot is not as significant so Christine so it wasn't just that the two spot the way they have it originally done it's, it's tight to maneuver to get in and out of those spots because it is a smaller space. It's only, um, I think, 17 feet, or nine and nine, 18 feet. Yeah. We're talking about these spots? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're actually 16. Yeah, yeah it's 16, right. So it looks like we're heading towards continuing the public hearing, but I'd like to give the applicant as clear a sense as possible of what we would look for in a layout. Uh, Jack, you have a comment? Uh, I was just wondering, what's the grade change between uh, the street and the drive? Uh, grade right here is 299. That's 300, 301, and then uh, it's 300. It's relatively flat through here. This is 299 here, and then 300 goes like that. It's 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 pretty level. So it sounds like so far, Christine supports option A. Fari supports the original proposal, as I do. Other thoughts from any members, Jack? Yeah, I I. I like keeping the wall uh, and, 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 and the use. I don't really, I, I just looked at them on the Google Street View and they're just, they're, they're nothing of uh, any consequence. So if the drive was to widen, I think I would go toward the street. If you uh, took the, uh, the plantings out in front of the house entirely, how, how, what would that gain you in terms of driveway width? 
The wall, I believe, is 12 feet from the property line, 12 or 13 feet from the property line, the existing wall. So, not much. Can, uh, can a driveway be built right on the property line, or does it have to be set back? Chris? A driveway can be built right on the property line. Well, I, I would have to think that if the um, museum uh, management doesn't um, object, the removal of those trees would be uh, uh, a good idea uh, and would actually show the house off uh, better as part of the overall uh, historic package uh, than, it, than it now shows. It's, it's, I've walked by there lots of times. Uh, it's a much more interesting house if you could see it without the trees in front of it. Uh, and I think that would be an advantage to the uh, overall property combination of the three houses now. Sure, I'll be happy to discuss it with them. Jack? Yeah, that's what I was, that's where I'm at too. With what Have you had this Wilson conversation said. with the, sta with, the uh, with the director? Yeah, the intent was um, to leave, leave the vegetation that's there. Um, it does screen the cars that are going to be there. Mm -hmm. It also gives it a sense of privacy that it's not necessarily a public building unless you're accessing it from the public entrance. So, Christine? Just again, that's a temporary fix. These views are not going to last forever, so this purpose will probably last longer than that, so it will have to be thought of. Um, and then just looking at the scale roughly, it seems that the pinch point, the tightest, the wall to the street appears to be about 14 feet and widens from there. From the existing wall, from the existing yeah. plan? Um, up near the driveway point, if you measure from the wall to the property line, that would be the smallest point and it looks about 14 feet. So looking at plan L101, yeah. Once again, it all comes down to a wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Christine? So it actually is like, the, say 13, 14, but you're actually in the driveway then, so it becomes obsolete because you have the room there. So as you move into the U's, it's 14, 15. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm being highly technical using my eraser to use the scale. Is that a half size? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Only as good as your equipment. <laughs> it, should, it should say do not scale somewhere on these notes. <laughs> uh, but again, I'm more, I, let's see what the historic district wants to have it, see what, how we proceed with the wall, and then um, I think ultimately what I need from you is the, the count, the parking count. And then I can come back with a proposal. Are members in a place to make a recommendation on the parking count? Christine has suggested that it be maximized. I think maximizing the parking uh, from three, the, the, the exist the proposed three to four, is is a, a good idea in theory, but it's probably not as important given the fact that um, there are so many other considerations to uh, work through here. Uh, I think I would like to have C four spaces there, but uh, if it doesn't 
fit in with the overall architectural uh, scheme, then I'm not really concerned about it since four is nowhere near the total maximum that we would really need there anyway. Uh, I think the difference between one and between three and four is uh, relatively insignificant, although I would tend to go toward four if, if there seems to be, if there's no good reason to stay at three. And I, I, I sort of sense there's a good reason to stay at three, but I'm not convinced one way or the other firmly. So um, having, oh, I would also be satisfied with three parking spaces on the site, especially if the issues we've discussed can be addressed, including the feasibility of plowing the surface and improving the visibility when entering or exiting the driveway. Jack? I agree. Uh, I, I think there's adequate parking on Amherst College property nearby as well, which is, I think, important. Christine? So I think it, it, it's up to the historical committee to talk about the wall, which is part of why this came about. Um, so, you know, if it stays three, if we can just widen, it's really tight there. I think they're not really very usable spaces, especially when we were out there today and looking at how it gets plowed and all that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Is that some clear enough guidance for your, your next steps? I heard three. Great. Very good. That's what we said. <laughs> all right. Any other questions, comments from the board? Applicants? Just... Christine? So if they say you have to keep the wall, then that's the point. Then rethink the parking again. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify, I think Chris spoke about this aspect of the process already. The um, Local Historic District Commission is not advisory to the planning board. They need to issue their own certificate of appropriateness for the project. So they have their own discretion. It's not that they're advising us per se, but these are parallel processes. So uh, what we've discussed is continuing the public hearing and the next planning board meeting would be March 20th. Chris, how is that meeting looking as far as uh, fullness of the agenda? I don't, yes, we do have Amherst Media that night. Amherst Media is going to be um, kind of a challenge, I think, so it'll probably take a while. Um, and I don't think you have other things on for that night. All right, and would that date work for the applicant? Great. That being the case, I'd entertain a motion to continue the public hearing to March 20th. Kari? So I'm making a motion to Shall we close the public hearing? Or no, we're continue continuing it. To continue um, to review the SPR 2019-03 to the next meeting. Great. Okay. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you so much. We'll Thank see you, you next time. All right. Moving on with our agenda, the next item is... 5A, Old Business, Planning Board Rules and Regulations, Review and Update to Bring into Compliance with home, Amherst Home Rule Charter and Other Issues. This was a conversation we started at a previous Planning Board meeting, and staff has since done some research, which is included in our packet. Uh, Chris, would you mind just giving us a brief summary of that? So um, site plan review was um, first uh, instituted in Amherst in, in the 1980s. And at that time, um, there was um, a, a desire to make it as close as possible to the special permit process so that the vote for the site plan review was set at um, two-thirds of the planning board. Two-thirds of the planning board at that time was um, six, six out of nine. Um, then later on in the 1990s, um, there was a court case in... I forget what town it was, Stockbridge, Sturbridge, Sturbridge, Osberg versus Sturbridge, I believe was the case. Um, and that case um, stated that uh, you did not need to have a two thirds vote for site plan review, um, that a majority would be sufficient. Um, and it appears that Amherst 
took that to heart, and um, but only partially took it to heart because they changed the rules to say that um, for site plan review, a two-thirds vote was required, but no less than five. So they backed off from the six out of nine to say five out of nine would be required to pass site plan review, and that was in 1998. Um, and we have remained at that, um, that vote count ever since. Um, so now you're being asked to determine uh, what should the vote be for um, a, a planning board of seven people? And from the research that we've done, it turns out that um, most cities and towns who have site plan review um, require a majority um, vote for, for site plan review. It's considered to be um, a by right type of approval. Um, in other words, the use is by right, and the planning board has the ability to tell the applicant how to do the use, how many parking spaces, how much landscaping, what kind of lighting, et cetera, but you can't say no to the use. So that's considered to be kind of a step down from the more rigorous um, special permit application and review process. So that's why, um, because it's a, it's a by right use, that's why these cities and towns are choosing to go with the majority. And I believe that that's uh, backed up by the Osberg case. So I hope you've had a chance to read the memo that we wrote to you about the history. And um, I also spoke with Mr. Tucker, who was the planning director previous to me. And he agreed with that assessment and that history. Um, so now I put it into your hands to decide which way to go. All right, well, first I want to thank staff for doing that analysis and digging back to 19, the late 80s to, uh, to find out the origins of this current uh, bylaw. And I support the analysis and the recommendation uh, that uh, Chris just laid out. I do have one question, which is whether the um, language in question, the place it finds in the zoning bylaw, if a similar change was recommended or made by the bylaw review committee. I see in the recommendations here that we would need to have our recommendations adopted by the town council as an amendment to the zoning bylaw. So I take that to mean that no change was, has yet been made. Chris? No change has yet been recommended by the bylaw review committee. They didn't make substantive changes to the bylaw or make recommendations about substance, substantive changes. They just recommended um, changes to bring the bylaw into conformance with the charter and then they left the rest of it to the planning board. Um, so you might consider, whatever you decide about this particular issue, that um, it's probably going to be this change in your rules and regulations would be on a parallel track with a change in the zoning bylaw because you can't have one say one thing and the other say another thing. So this um, preparation, this discussion that you're having now is kind of a precursor to uh, holding a public hearing probably a, a few months from now um, when town council is ready to consider changes to the zoning bylaw. That would be my assessment on this. Uh, so that being the case, would it not make sense to remove reference to voting requirements in the planning board rules and regulations? That may be a reasonable uh, thing to do. Um, I'm not familiar with rules and regulations that don't have voting requirements in them. Well, that's not true. I don't think the zoning board rules and regs have voting requirements, but I could check on that. And so. I guess if I could clarify, we need not remove the section entirely, but rather just say that the voting requirements will be as stated in the zoning bylaw if we need to retain a reference, because otherwise we have this, these double processes going on. So, All right, other comments, questions? I think Michael had something to say on this. All right. Yeah, I also want to echo your um, <clears throat> thanks to the staff. I think this was a, an exceptionally useful package that you put together for us, uh, outlining a wide variety of, of opinions and attitudes about the uh, issue. I, I wanted to, to uh, point out that, um, sorry, that, um, um, that Osberg v. Sturbridge um, is a little less uh, proscriptive than, than I think you're suggesting. Uh, on the, the uh, let's see, it's the fourth, fifth, fifth page, 
the pages aren't numbered, so it's hard to tell. On the fifth page of the, the head of the, of the second paragraph uh, begins, without deciding whether a municipality without statutory authority may impose the vote requirements. Uh, it's, it's, it simply suggests to me that the court case did not choose to decide that issue of whether there could, whether there could, there could be a, three, a two thirds vote or a majority vote. It left that, it left that uh, open, uh, simply saying that the town did not establish otherwise. Uh, implying, I believe, that it could establish otherwise if it chose to do so. And then on the next page, it goes on, in the absence of contrary statutory provision, which suggests to me that contrary statutory provision could exist, um, rather than simply saying it has to be just this way, it seems to suggest that the municipality in question could decide which way it wanted to be, whether it would be a majority vote or a two-thirds vote. Um, so uh, I think the, 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 stand, the legal standing of the question is a little bit um, murkier than that. Um, I'm looking for another, another citation here. Um, uh, given that, um, um, opening, I should say, not loophole, but opening, um, it seems to me that we would be within our rights to uh, request or um, ask the town council to legislate um, a, a two-thirds vote as a requirement for site plan, uh, site plan review. Um, but I think the real issue is how does two-thirds get interpreted when we don't have a full body um, voting, uh, which is sometimes the case. Uh, I would imagine that um, I did a little bit of temporary math here, that uh, two-thirds of seven votes is 4.666 votes, or five. So that if we have a two-thirds vote, um, a, f a five would be required. Uh, for a three, with a two-thirds vote and only a four would be the majority. If we have six people voting, uh, it's four both ways. Uh, two-thirds and majority would be both be four. If we have only five people, five people voting, then it, both ways it's three. So the only real issue is when we have a full board voting, do we have uh, a five votes to carry or four votes to carry? Um, I suspect with the kinds of uh, Issues that we're dealing with, um, I would I would suggest that uh, a, seven, a, um, a two thirds vote or five people uh, would be an appropriate uh, number, um, and I think we're within our rights in terms of the the way I read the the, the court decision that we, you sent to us uh, to request that or to suggest that or to put that in as our as our preference. I don't know whether it is our preference, but I think we, would, we could do that if we wanted to do, to do that. And uh, I would like to do that. So uh, um, I'm not sure how, how we get at this in terms of, of motions. I guess we need to go through the um, um, suggested rules and regulations that uh, we have on our, on our desk tonight. And when we get to that uh, issue, um, address it. But I think um, that's, that's the way I see the issue. Jack? Uh, I thought uh, the way Mike explained it was good because you might as well just spell out, you know, like you did, if there are seven present versus six versus five, just, I mean, who wants to do the math? Uh, <laughs> Mike already did it. <laughs> Maria? I think the, the, the planning staff was saying that that then makes site plan review equivalent to special permit, and that's not what they would prefer, because the special permit is a more difficult level of approval, and site plan review is not, and so it's not really fair to give that 5-7 vote to both types of approval processes. So I, I actually agree with sort of what the staff and Mr. Tucker were saying, that 5 out of 7 is not a reasonable voting requirement for a by right use. Christine? 
So, um, Chris, could you explain a little bit how the trend? So, actually, I'll back up. So, I did a lot of research on this also. And so, if you read the actual case, you're right, it's sort of vague, but it, you have to look at the history of what happened. So, most of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts wrote their zoning in the 80s, and it was the two thirds or the supermajority. And then it, um, when this court case happened in 97, if you look historically, many towns in the Commonwealth reevaluated and changed to the simple majority. Um, and then, um, and some towns haven't addressed come back to it at all. But there's also, and this is what I thought Chris could maybe explain, there's been a house, uh, a bill in the house that's been trying to get through the last couple of years on redoing zoning and they're still hoping it will go through one of these years and it keeps getting debated. But that one is to make an SPR a simple majority, but it's actually so much that Governor Baker is pushing for special permit to be a simple majority. And I'm reading an article here um, last year, him talking about it, and it says that only 10 states in the country require super majorities for um, zoning changes. And he, his feeling is it's hurting the economic development and it's not, it puts undue pressure and restrictions on, on development. So if Chris could just explain, you know, um, I forget what it's H, do you remember? It, yeah. Chris? I'm afraid I haven't read the latest Zoning Reform Act. They come out every year and yeah. they're all very similar with slight tweaks. I think the effort is to um, make regulations with regard or, or make um, decisions with regard to housing um, much simpler and not require two-thirds vote for housing and also not require two-thirds vote for zoning, for zoning amendments. Um, but I'm not sure um, about more detailed uh, writing than that. I could look into it. Um. Michael. Well, uh, I don't want to monopolize this, but with all due respect to Governor Baker and to uh, Mr. Tucker, uh, I, I, should, I think people who acquire property in a part of town which is zoned in a certain way expect that zoning to continue for the life of their ownership of the property. Um, and um, I think if a simple majority can change the zoning or can um, seriously affect the way in which uh, a property is, is used in, in, in special permit terms or looks in uh, SPR, in site plan review terms, um, I think um, we're, we're, selling, we're selling out the public. I, I think we need to be more rigorous in terms of um, following the zoning regulations that, that as, as they exist rather than less rigorous. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, a two-thirds vote uh, in, for SPR uh, moves in that direction. And uh, regardless of what other towns do, and I understand that other towns have gone to a majority vote in this, in this area, um, um, I, I still don't think we should do it. I think we should stay with or, or should establish uh, a two-thirds uh, majority, a super majority, if you want to call it that, um, for uh, these kinds of issues. I just want to respond to one thing you mentioned, Michael, there, which is you suggested that this would allow zoning to be changed under the requirements we're discussing. And it's my understanding that's not the case. The changes to zoning are now outside the purview of the planning board. We make recommendations. The town council adopts them. Um, so zoning could not be changed based on the requirements we're discussing here. Um, and I think that, as was mentioned before, the fact that these decisions are made about properties and projects, which the use is not in question. The, the use is going to be allowed regardless. We're just looking at parameters of the site. It means that, indeed, it is a lower threshold, as it has been and should remain. And to go to the five out of seven requirement, that equates to 71% of the board, which I think 
is a higher percentage requirement than has ever been in place. So by not addressing this change that has happened to our charter, um, by not enacting the language that staff has um, proposed, we're making a higher threshold. And I appreciate the point that you would prefer a higher threshold, but I don't think that the point of the charter was to make things more difficult for site plan review um, applicants. So I'm in support of the, the language that staff has proposed. I think it's the right direction to go. Jack? Well said, Greg. <laughs> Thank you. He said, well said. I didn't hear what you said, Jack. I said, well said. And just to note also that we're not at a place where we can act on any of these because we need to hold a public hearing to make any changes. So what we're trying to do is determine what language would be proposed prior to holding that public hearing. Um, David? Yeah, I, I agree with Greg and Maria um, and that the, it's the distinction between site plan and a special permit, that distinction should be reflected, I think, in the voting requirements as well. And that the site plan review does have a lower, a, it's a by right as opposed to a discretionary uh, um, authority uh, for the, the, that that lower voting requirement is makes that distinction consistent. So I think we have some differences of opinion on what should happen with the language proposed by staff, but I'm not sure that we have a difference of opinion that we should act on it. So I would propose that we hold in the near future, perhaps at our next meeting, a public hearing to further discuss and possibly vote on whether or not to adopt the changes that staff has proposed. Sounds good. Any, I, would, I don't think we need a formal motion to decide to place this on our agenda for a future meeting, Chris. I'm a little nervous about putting the cart before the horse in the sense that if you change your rules and regs and the zoning bylaw isn't changing, then um, you may be in a bit of a quandary. I know you had suggested taking that language out entirely. There wasn't really a discussion on that by the board, so I'm not sure what direction uh, everyone wants to go in with regard to that. Um, if you did take the language out entirely, I think you might be able to amend your rules and regs without waiting for the zoning bylaw. Um, but anyway, that's something for your consideration. Yeah, so I'd amend my suggestion that we hold a public hearing to incorporate language into the Planning Board Rules and Regulations to say that the voting requirements are as stated in the zoning bylaw. And then separate from that, Chris, is it now our process, and this would be our first zoning proposal uh, to the Town Council, is it our process that we would need to hold a public hearing to discuss any recommendation that we might make, Chris? I'm not exactly sure how um, Town Council will be handling zoning um, regulations and whether they will want regulations to come or amendments to come from the Planning Board or whether they will want to um, propose regulations themselves. Um, they are setting up a community resource committee as um, part of the Town Council. So it's unclear exactly how proposals will get to town council but I I suppose the planning board could you know strongly recommend that some change be made and then town council would take it up and then what they would do is pass it down to the planning board to hold a public hearing it's um, mm -hmm. I'm not actually sure what the formal procedure is going to be so if I understand correctly, to this point, the only zoning changes have been those proposed by the bylaw review committee. Is that committee still active? Chris? There is a committee uh, called the bylaw Re review committee. Um, I think it has slightly different membership than it had <coughs> previously, but it is still active. I asked the question because the changes to zoning which were recommended and adopted, recommended by that committee, adopted by town council were because that committee found that these changes were needed to keep our zoning bylaw in compliance with the charter and its purposes. Yes, Chris? So the town council has not yet taken up those recommended changes that the bylaw review committee recommended. Even though you voted to recommend them on December 12th, um, the town council 
hasn't yet taken those up. So I would suggest we revisit our recommendation on that to potentially include this needed change to keep the bylaw in keeping with the charter. What process, Chris, would you see for that? It's a little bit muddying the waters, I think, because the bylaw review committee has come up with this entire document of um, proposals which they say is non-substantive. And this proposal that you're, well, you're proposing to take something out of the bylaw, but I'd have to think about that a little bit and probably get some advice about it. Okay, so I do think it's reasonable to move towards resolution on this that we hold the public hearing to discuss the change to planning board rules and regulations, which would be to remove essentially the duplicate reference to voting requirements and just simply say in that section that they shall be as stated in the zoning bylaw. Does that sound reasonable to everyone? Mm -hmm. All right, and I think we could do that at our next meeting, <coughs> March 20th. Maybe that, um, make that, uh, uh, you, you can't hold a public hearing on March 20th because there's not enough time to advertise it, but you could hold a public hearing on April 3rd if you'd like to do that. Would you like me to schedule a public hearing? Is um, that agenda heavy so far? Um, uh, Amir Mikchi's um, proposal for a mixed-use building is on that agenda, but I think that's the only uh, item. So do you want to hold a public hearing on that night? Any? I'm not sure. Jack? I won't be here. I won't be here. Christine? If we could push it to the next one. Looks like there's a consensus to do this the third Wednesday of April. You had proposed the, f the third? I had proposed April 3rd, which is the first planning board meeting in April. So the next one would be uh, 14 17. days after that, which would be the 17th. 17th? That's, is I'm that school vacation week? Well, we have one not present for the 17th and two not present for the third, so. You could do it in the, middle, in the beginning of May. April 17th, okay, everyone? So April, April 17th. 17th. Thank you. I ask um, all the other changes that were proposed in the, uh, the bylaw were acceptable to you, with the exception of this new thing that is being added? That were recommended by the bylaw review committee? No, I mean, um, let, let me go back a minute. Um, I thought we were talking about these changes to the rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. These changes were recommended by staff, planning department staff. Right, not yes. By, not we had previously bylaw. discussed those being acceptable. I think the one we discussed in depth tonight was the one that there was further conversation on. Are others in agreement that we should be proceeding with the other changes recommended by staff? Okay. All right. Yes. Good. I Great. understand what you're saying now. Okay. Okay. Anything else on the topic of the planning board rules and regulations? We've already gone over most of these items with the exception of planning board committee and liaison reports, PVPC. No report. Uh, oh, I, Christine? I do have one. I went to the last meeting and Chris forwarded an email um, to you all about the survey, the transportation survey. There was a link on that. I think the email went out on February 25th. I can go back and look at it and um, something about how they're starting their transportation plan. And there was a great thing they have launched called pioneervalleydata.org and I totally recommend everyone just go and visit that because it's a real great data source and they've done a great job. Great, thanks. Uh, CPAC? Um, yes, I, I have been uh, nominated and sworn in, and uh, had, we've had our first meeting, which was primarily organizational. The next four meetings in the next, on the next four Thursdays uh, are to uh, hear all of the um, applicants. Uh, there are some 20 requests for uh, 
the uh, the funds, and uh, we will be deciding them uh, probably the first meeting in um, April. So your nomination, you've been appointed formally. Yes. Great. So we can update our packets. Excellent. Is the same true of Ag Commission and PARI? I haven't been notified that I've been approved yet, but there haven't been any meetings also. So, Chris? I think there was a real push to approve or to appoint people to CPAC because they have to act mm -hmm. in a certain limited amount of time. Yeah. So other appointments may tend to lag a little bit. All right, Design Review Board. Uh, no report there. Uh, Affordable Housing Trust has not met since we last met. Zoning Subcommittee, same situation. UTAC, um, I suppose we have a report of sorts, which is that my understanding is that we are formally going to be dissolving uh, UTAC, and there will be, or there already was. Uh, Christine, do you? Actually, there's a meeting of yes. UTAC on March 25th at 2 p.m., yeah. I believe, in this room, and it's to think about the role or how it should evolve. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't see the in the email dissolve, but I don't know. Yeah. Well, my sense was that it, it seemed like a closing to collect feedback from how things went. So it's possible that the group would continue, but in a different form. That's because, different, again, right. my subcommittee had not met in probably 18 months. Um, and the downtown parking working group. Um, just the consultant continues to do their work. They did do some stakeholder meetings and they're planning to have public forums um, in the next, in about a month or two. Great, thanks. Uh, report of the chair, I have no report. Report of staff. No report. All right, then we'll be adjourned. Thanks so much, everyone.